Euzubillahimineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi şirah li sadri ve sirli emri ve ehli nükteden min lisani yefkahu kavli. Selamun aleyküm everyone. Selamun aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatü. İnşallah we will start with a new chapter today. The 23rd word. The 23rd word. This word contains two chapters. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Indeed, we have created man on the most excellent of patterns that sent him down to the lowest of the low, except those who believe and do good deeds. First chapter. We shall explain in five points only five of the virtues of belief out of thousands. First point. Through the light of belief, Man rises to the highest of the high and acquires a value worthy of paradise. And through the darkness of unbelief, he descends to the lowest of the low and falls to a position fit for help. For belief connects man to the all-glorious maker. It is a relation. Thus, man acquires value by virtue of the divine art and inscriptions of the dominical names which become apparent in him through belief. Unbelief severs the relation. And due to that severance, the dominical art is concealed. His value then is only in respect to the matter of his physical being. And since this matter has only a transitory, passing, temporary animal life, its value is virtually nothing. We shall explain this mystery by means of a comparison. For example, among man's arts, the value of the materials used and that of the art are entirely different. Sometimes they are equal Sometimes the material is more valuable, and sometimes it happens that five liras worth of art is to be found in material like iron worth five kurush. You may say like five dollars, five cents. Sure. Kurush is cent, and the lira is dollar. Okay. Sometimes they are equal, sometimes the material is more valuable, and sometimes it happens that five dollars worth of art is to be found in material like iron worth five cents. Sometimes, even an antique work of art is worth a million, while the material of which it is composed is not worth five cents. If such a work of art is taken to the antiques market and ascribed to a brilliant and accomplished artist of former times and announced mentioning the artist and that art, it may be sold for a million dollars. Whereas, if it is taken to the scrap dealers, the only price received will be for the five cents worth of iron. Thus, man is such an antique work of art of Almighty God. He is a most subtle and graceful miracle of his power whom he created to manifest all his names and their inscriptions in the form of a miniature specimen of the universe. If the light of belief enters his being, all the meaningful inscription, inscriptions on him may be read. If the light of belief enters his being, all the meaningful inscriptions on him may be read. As one who believes, he reads them consciously, and through that relation, causes others to read them. That is to say, the dominical art in man becomes apparent through meanings like, I am the creature and artifact of the all-glorious maker. I manifest his mercy and munificence. That is, belief, which consists of being connected to the maker, makes apparent all the works of art in man. Man's value is in accordance with that dominical art, and by virtue of being a mirror to the eternally besought one. In this respect, insignificant man becomes God's, becomes God's addressee and a guest of the sustainer worthy of paradise superior to all other creatures. However, should unbelief, which consists of the severance of the relation, enter man's being, then all those meaningful inscriptions of the divine names are plunged into darkness and become illegible. For if the maker is forgotten, the spiritual aspects which look to him will not be comprehended. They will be as though reversed. The majority of those meaningful sublime arts and elevated inscriptions will be hidden. The remainder, those that may be seen with the eye, will be attributed to lowly causes, nature, and chance, and will become utterly devoid of value. While they are all brilliant diamonds, they become dull pieces of glass. His importance looks only to his animal, physical being. 
And as we said, the aim and fruit of his physical being is only to pass a brief and partial life as the most impotent, needy, and grieving of animals. Then it decays and departs. See how unbelief destroys human nature and transforms it from diamonds into coal. <laughs> So very interesting part, the way I understand it's about the value of the human, uh, that value that we all seek. Mm. Anyone wants to give a shot on you know, the overall picture of the, the part that we are discussing? Maybe a few sentences, maybe, I don't know, longer. Just give us an idea, like a guidance that, you know, this is the part is about, and we should study these aspects. Okay, we have a shy group today. Probably everyone is contemplating so deeply about their value. So he's talking about the human value and how belief changes this. Uh, what happens to you with belief, without belief? What happens to your value? Uh, value, I guess, at least to me, the most important is the way I perceive myself, which is also reflected toward the, through my relationship with other people, other creatures. Uh, at least it is true that most of the time, most of my life, let's put it that way, uh, you know, as you become honest to yourself, it becomes clearer that most of my life has been wasted and being continued to be wasted uh, by searching a value for myself, that trying to prove myself to somebody, some group of people, maybe to myself, to my family. Other day I was sitting with my wife in waiting room for a green card application, We're waiting for the interview, and they told us that you know, they will uh, take us in a few minutes. It's been more than an hour, I guess, we, we are waiting there. Uh, we are waiting there so that we can give the right answers to the interviewer so that she or he would approve us and tell us that, okay, you are worthy of U.S. Uh, permanent uh, residency. And that was an, this authentic feeling uh, in me that I shared with my wife. I felt her, you know what, you know, all my life, I had to prove myself to someone. It doesn't end. It starts with, most of the time, it starts with schooling, like a primary school. Uh, but not only schooling, with your family, with your friends. You have to prove yourself. You have to show them that you are worthy of something. And it doesn't end. People tell you it will end. You know, once you finish high school, once you finish your university, once you get your PhD, once you become a professor, once you, it doesn't end. You have to prove yourself. You have to show that your material, as author put, is more than five cents. And I don't know, to me, at this, it becomes really uh, tiring. You get tired of it. And after a while, I guess you start believing that you don't worth any five cents. Uh, I mean, look at your age, but you still, you have to prove yourself. If you were valuable, you know, people would look and see it already. You wouldn't have to go to an interview to prove something. But this is the life. So, like personally speaking at least, Sometimes I say we, but it's me. That I am trying to find my value all my life. And I was not able to. 
up to this point. And now Walter said, you know, you worth millions of dollars. I don't know, hard to believe. Any comments before we start uh, with the beginning and start reading from there? Oh, so Hatija or Aisha, are you in a position that you can talk? If so, could you tell us, you know, why you are valuable? What is your value? Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. Please go ahead. Well, we're certainly valuable for being chosen first and foremost. Um, I guess it depends on how you define value. Um, what makes something valuable? Uh, is it the permanence of something? Is it uh, the material aspect of something? Or uh, uh, in, in terms of, I guess, my value in, in my existence, um, um, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what, what I, I, I don't know if I can answer the question of what makes me valuable. I think I can maybe talk about the need to be valuable. Um, I think that's very inherent. Uh, I feel the need to be valuable in terms of my relationships, in terms of my studies. Um, and I guess in that there's an inherent also need for um, validation, as you were saying. I, I, you know, there's this constant need for validation, maybe validation as a daughter, as a sister, as a student. Um, and it seems like, you know, someone, anyone in any of those relations could constantly offer you validation but it never seems sufficient or never seems completely um satisfactory uh even if someone does say you're valuable or uh maybe you win an award or something uh there's always a sense of i think uh self-deception that's involved as well of you know, deep down knowing that regardless of however anyone may perceive you as, um, there's this feeling that whatever you're doing is not really coming from you um, or it's not because of you. Whatever product you're giving or even today um, I was talking with someone and they said that you know, what I did made them feel important. And they were thanking me for making them feel important, but it wasn't something that, even in that sort of relationship, it's not something that you choose. I mean, the feelings of love or compassion or anything, I, you've, I, find, that I find myself with them. Um, and it doesn't feel right to be thanked for those sorts of things. So, I mean, I'm kind of put on the spot here. I think both of us are mainly me since I'm doing the speaking here, but I, I would say what makes me valuable, now I'm kind of going on a little bit. Um, ultimately, I think, I don't know if this is a shortcut answer, uh, and we can talk about how one can individually arrive at it, but I would say whatever gives my life meaning, um, ultimately, in terms of my existence, makes me valuable. And in, in that respect, it's my relationship with my creator because it ties every single other relationship I have in this world, whether it's with uh, my sister, my cat, the tree across from me, it makes all of those interactions meaningful. It allows me to appreciate them in a eternally, absolutely satisfying sense. And I think Farah Zabi wants to talk, so I'll just cut a short from there. Thank you. <coughs> no, I... Uh, I should please go ahead. I was just tink tinkering with this to see how do I raise my hand, and I couldn't figure out a way of raising my hand except unmuting myself. So I was just 
dealing with it. So if you if you were saying something, I I wasn't trying to cut you short. So please go ahead. I I think we're at least Aishinur is good. Um, just to uh, very simply add on, I think um, also uh, by virtue of being something that makes me valuable, it is necessary for that which add, gives me value to be something that is um, valuable, meaning that it is something that is of a permanent nature, right? Otherwise, similar to um, Burkhanabi's introduction, you know, seeking validation or seeking value in one thing or another, it never seems to satisfy because um, either the things themselves are transient or I'm transient or uh, I keep wanting more. So there is never a limit to, okay, I'm this like feeling this much valuable will be enough. I'm always looking at something beyond what seems to be within my immediate, um, what is immediately accessible to me as far as like my, uh, I guess like surface relationship with things. So if, you know, I, I do something for my sister, then I become a good sister. So that's a validation point there. But then I want to be, you know, how do I, sustain that relationship or how do I become the best really sister, mm-hmm. sister the supreme sister in the whole <laughs> wild world um or you know it never so by the point is the by virtue of whatever it is that gives me value must be something that is of a non-transient nature must be permanent and thus somehow must be um absolute thank you so, uh, Birkan, is it okay if I go now, or speak now, or what do you think? Oh, please, go ahead. It's more than okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, very interesting to me, this part. I've been reading this, uh, thankfully, this piece, because of my own personal uh, project. Um, <laughs> this is... Uh, very interesting, but I don't want to speak too much, but I thought maybe I can, on a, on a lighter note, share just a couple um, uh, hats and other people will share their thoughts. So two different uh, things I will just share quickly as far as I can. One, I recently read an interesting little thing where a scholar of the Bible was saying how he once heard a woman uh, telling her pastor pastor, uh, that she finds great comfort and support in in the blessed word Mesopotamia. It's a a word in the Bible. And he he narrated that how, you know, he, he smiled, but he also understood because, you know, he was started talking about how human beings need a connection with God, something higher, bigger, powerful, on whom they can count, and word those connections. Um, and, and this is an example of words being connections without even somebody knowing what they mean. A word like Mesopotamia, which she read in the Bible, in one of the biblical words, and she said, I read and support in the blessed word Mesopotamia. Uh, and this is just a, an example of the idea that human beings find value and support and come in connecting with God, even when the words that they use to connect do not, they don't understand those. Uh, you know, for this woman, Mesopotamia, we can think of many words, you know, mashallah, inshallah, alhamdulillah, and we know and we select people words and without maybe if they were pressed to, you know, say, what, what does these mean? They may not be able to explain, but these are connections in, in one level. One sort of charitable interpretation is that, you know, this is connection is so important for pe- giving people support. It's an example. Uh, so that was interesting. And that ties to what Nursi is talking about, you know, reading these 
names, essentially, dominical arts. I think we call it dominical to refer to their sacred nature rather than just art as an aesthetic value, in which case it would be reduced to something material, something that belongs to the thing. And so we can think of, you know, something like kindness will be the same as vitamin D, you know, we, we don't really find valuable, someone valuable for having more vitamin D than somebody else. So we won't find somebody value of kindness more than somebody else as at all valuable. <laughs> uh, because as long as it is just a quality of their biological being, but as a dominical art that can be read, uh, even when it is not read as a, an example, even when it's just the idea of connecting you to God uh, can give people support. You know, we may call it, okay, it's a false maybe sense of support or not a very grounded sense, but still. Um, so that's uh, one thing. Uh, the other thing I want to share was, I also recently read, or I'm actually reading something about Fiji and the Fijian people. Um, something about how they respond to gift uh, giving and gift receiving. Someone gives a gift, he, they offer, and the receiver of the gift reaction to the gift till they have finished kind of, you know, that ceremony of giving the gift. And, and when that finishes, they, they turn to God, heavens, you know, they say, and they invoke, you know, blessings or, you know, that this is, the blessed, you, your blessings, and you pray to God to bless these people who are giving you a gift for um, these gifts, for these blessings that uh, you don't thank directly the giver of the gift. And, and this is interesting, again, you know, in parallel. In the, what is the value of, what is the of something we receive in the world value is that it connects you, reminds you, tells you of this abundant source that you uh, are reminded of, you can turn to. Um, so anyway, those are just curious little from things that I uh, encountered in some of the things I'm reading. So I thought, maybe yeah, uh, interesting. So, somehow related to the topic. Um, but maybe finally the idea that these are um, the, the main points, the connection. And then furthermore, um, if it is indeed connection with an eternal absolute, a God beyond this world is something permanent, something the source of, if that is what uh, really human beings long for and need, um, then we can, you know, we can understand that to be able to read uh, within oneself or in the world, uh, those qualities gives a sort of ground sense of that connection. It's not sort of a, uh, a better, more, how shall we say, more genuine, authentic connection. Because otherwise, if I simply want to be connected and I feel comfortable, but I don't read, you know, I just feel comfort in the word. But I don't actually, and then this comfort doesn't quite establish any ground in me for um, a satisfactory role in the universe of what I have, what, what, why I exist and what, what, why I'm here. And then I may still kind of on my own to in the world where I yes I keep finding comfort with God by connecting to God quote-unquote connecting but the world remains an enigma I still like Vilkan was saying try to uh, struggle with this idea that I deserve something and that when I deserve I must work for it until I get it whether it's reputation whether it's love whatever, you know, we, one tries to get those things and tries to find worth and purpose of these feelings and senses where if I go a bit further, 
finding comfort in Mesopotamia. And if I actually am able to read these things as dominical art, and I don't assign them to material B, uh, then I can read and I can more, um, you know, connection, which, uh, which, which, which, which, which trans the contradictions that these qualities are bring. Um, because otherwise they really become not only worthless, but actually they're ultimately really painful and uh, enigmatic and discomforting. And it's very difficult for me to feel gratitude or connection. And it's always sort of this wanting to feel connection, but not really feeling, not really having it. So. Um, this idea of reading belief as reading existence in a certain ways is, a, is an interesting one. Um, uh, anyway, I'm sorry, I took long. Uh, thanks a lot for us. It's been a while and that was a great opening. Uh, any other comments or should we continue? Uh, we should we start reading from the very beginning and discuss anyone else who wants to share their experience how they chase words in life as far as put how they try to make connection and then how they fail how they achieve we have a young person with us alhamdulillah she's so valuable for her father. So were you able to find your own value and worth in her eyes, Yusuf? I was thinking about the reverse. Like, uh, she's so valuable to me. Uh, I said, what does the author talk about in here as five cent? She's so valuable. She's not five cent. But, uh, Author is talking about a value, I guess, in which she is going to be, or he's talking about divine art or uh, dominical art. So, what is it that becomes uh, visible to me? Because everybody, I hear this from a lot of friends. They after a certain point in their marriage, they say they want to have a baby. And these people might be aware of the divine or not aware of divine. Everybody likes babies. Babies are cute, valuable, and just inherently they're beautiful as if. So uh, what does he mean when he says in here that uh, if the connection with the divine or the referring or attributing something in here to divine is cut, then the value is going to be so low. Or vice versa, if my love or value that I give to her is cut, what would it be like if I was attributing it to a true source? And uh, I guess everybody can experience this. Uh, Today we were just reading something about uh, traumatic brain injury and uh, the test set was like adolescence of age 15 and plus minus two years and uh, they were quite severely injured traffic accidents and immediately I think of my daughter and saying that because some of the subjects were in coma for seven weeks and I said, what sort of a thing, what would, what would I be like if my daughter, may Allah protect, is in coma for seven weeks? How, how would I feel? Then I realized what sort of a burden it is to me to love her just as she is. Because now I'm constantly worried for something that didn't happen, that is far from happening, hopefully, you never know. But it's a worry for me. So 
then this love or the value becomes so much of a burden, although it was so cute and so enjoyable initially, it became so burdensome to me immediately. And uh, so, and this happens, like she's growing so fast, her beauty, every day is a different beauty, but it's, it's changing, the things that I enjoyed yesterday is gone. And today, Alhamdulillah, something new is coming, but I know that this will also go, this is how life is going. So, uh, if I take this side of the relation between me and her, not only momentarily enjoy what's in front of me, but also aware of what it comes with, it's a really big burden. It becomes so, uh, you would say, well, I don't want to take it as it. But uh, connecting it to its true source, at least author is claiming, that uh, something more art worthy is going to be visible. I don't know how, we will try to see each other. Or are you too young to talk about the word and value? Uh, I don't know what that means. But what it reminds me, and I don't know if I was already talked about this, I was too distracted by the baby, but I remember his retreat, what the, the session he gave at the retreat, did he already, was he talking about this? Or, okay, at the retreat he was talking about evil and good, and how the things we consider good are really maybe not good, like knowledge or love or compassion. You think these are good things, but then before you know it, they're the source of your pain. and it shows you that your value, like you value yourself because of your knowledge or how kind you are or how compassionate you are. And you realize actually, no, these are the things that cause you pain and that's not where your value comes from. Uh, that's what it reminded me of. Anything from ladies here? Okay, let's start from the beginning. Uh, Ashim, would you like to read the first paragraph? Sure. First point, through the light of belief, man rises to the highest of the high and acquires a value worthy of paradise. Uh, man rises, human rises to the highest of the high and acquires a value worthy of paradise. And through the darkness of unbelief, he descends to the lowest of the law and falls to a position fit for hell. And through the darkness of unbelief, he descends to the lowest of the law and falls to a position fit for hell. So the author said, through the light of belief, so I guess this light is also important. The light of belief, human rises to the highest of the high and acquires a value worthy of paradise, but through the darkness of unbelief, he descends to the lows of the law and falls to a position fit for hell. For belief connects men to the all-glorious maker. Belief connects men to the all-glorious maker. It is a relation. As uh, Faraz was saying, it's a connection. Or I guess the relation can be taken in different ways, like a relation in the sense of connection, relation in the sense of, uh, as a reference point, maybe, as well. Thus, man acquires value by virtue of the divine art and inscriptions of the dominical names which become apparent in him through belief. So through belief, man, a human would acquire some value through virtue of divine art and inscriptions of dominical names. On the other hand, unbelief severs the relation and due 
due to that severance, the dominical art is concealed. So unbelief will cut this connection, and the dominical art in human will conceal. His value then is only in respect to the matter of his physical being. And since this matter has only a transitory, passing temporary animal life, its value is virtually nothing. We shall explain this mystery by means of a comparison. Sarah then continues. And the comparison is, you know, he talks about an antique work uh, or a painting, maybe, masterpiece. It worth millions of dollars. But the material itself, the painting, it's just a regular canvas and regular paint. Nothing special. And at the time of most of these uh, master works, uh, the paint uh, comes from some plants. Not even processed in a you know a big factory, just from plants, some insects. It's worth really nothing. The Mona Lisa worth nothing, but as a Mona Lisa, it's worth millions of dollars. And anyway, he talks about this: the belief, unbelief, the connection become uh, making dominical art and names apparent. And unbelief severing it. So, any comments, questions, objections at this point? I would say, but we should give a break for Margaret prayer, I guess. And let's give a break for 10 minutes. And meanwhile, please think about this distinction between belief and unbelief of connecting with your. All glorious maker have a relationship with an all glorious maker makes you valuable, and severance of this connection how makes you uh, worthless. The first question would be, I guess, uh, the metaphor that the author is using: the light of belief and darkness of unbelief. Why do you think this is so? Light of belief, darkness of unbelief. What kind of darkness is talking about, or what kind of light is referred to? Any ideas? Anyone? I think um, sometimes, especially you know, if you're in a state of low iman or no iman at all. Just a little bit high. Yeah. Some people joining us online. So. Oh, awesome! Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I think sometimes when you're in a state of low iman or maybe no iman at all, um, things seem like very sweet to you, and they seem like very kind of interesting and, and worthwhile. Uh, and, and you may think that you're getting pleasure out of certain things, but um, that's kind of a state of darkness because true kind of um, pleasure and, and sweetness comes from man and comes from understanding you know, what it is to draw closer to the law. Mm -hmm. So I think that the lightness may be kind of, I mean, I, again, I just joined, but um, maybe kind of shining a light on what, what is truly important and what is truly kind of. Any other comments? So just the idea I had, uh, or the thought, when we're talking about what makes us valuable, I was thinking, like, I don't think there's anything I can do that can make me valuable. I think value is already there, like, and, like, this lightness and darkness, like, the, it made me think of, let's imagine a room. It's a dark room and has furniture inside. Okay. The furniture is in there, but if it's dark, you don't see it. And with unbelief, if it's dark, you don't see it. But the value is still there. The furniture is still there. But let's say you do flip the switch, and then the light hits it. Then you see that it's there's you are already value. There's already value in there. There's like all the furniture is already in there. It's not that even with the belief, you don't even become valuable because you have belief. It's more that because you look through the light of belief, you finally see the value, and you see it's not has nothing to do with the physical or like what you have done or what you haven't done. It's more just the now you're just seeing it in different light. So this part, I guess, it's like a summary, the first paragraph. So he will explain what he means. Uh, the human making a connection with the old glorious maker, and then it, this connection revealing all these divine art and uh, names. But as a 
first understanding. Like, oh, first, let's go ahead. Yeah, so uh, no, uh, I'm just sticking my nose in the conversation, really. I, I don't really need to speak, but I, I'm just also uh, <laughs> uh, just, uh, I guess, missing you guys after many weeks. I was able to join, so I'm just sticking my nose as if I'm also in the room. <laughs> so, uh, you know, well, so one thing just came to me that it doesn't seem like in the Nursi, like what he's saying, that human beings. Or I, I am if assuming that I am interested deliberately in the aim of gaining value. Um, it like he's, or the question to the case that being is actively look for its value. And is that the goal here? Like, how can I be valuable or, or, or is it that that the nature of reality is being described such that certain certain uh, how shall I say you know that that certain way of looking at reality is uh, <laughs> makes uh, ma makes us reach the conclusion that if if for example a thing let's say the human being if a has this kind of value, then it is this value, uh, whatever has this kind of value is worthy of a, how shall we say, a, a realm of a perfection and a realm of never ending perfection. That this is the reality. Uh, you know, whether it's really sort of almost independent of whether human being, any particular human being is uh, looking to feel valuable or not, but but but but that this is the reality, and yeah, surely, to the extent that then I will ask myself, you know, would I would I like to be in a realm? Would I like to understand things, the value of them, in a way that makes me that this is for a never-ending and perfect realm in itself? Or or not, uh, but uh, it it's it, it doesn't seem to me that the, you know the text puts it as a or foregrounds uh, that human being looking you know for something valuable, but it is more sort of saying you know the reality is structured in a way that when when you look at it. Um, with the light of belief again you know when you look at it <laughs> with this perspective and you can say we can say that then you see that okay if some if if there is like abdul rahman was saying if there, there is beauty there is goodness this mercy this that i experience and i see in the world there are all these things what are uh, what is this worth what is, is the value of it what uh, what will allow these really beautiful things to actually uh, be you're just be justified? What justifies their existence of this, this beauty? Like how how is it that I see it, um, and so then I have this thing where I can actually uh, again you know consider that that um, recognize worthy of paradise that uh, it is that connection not not like human being will do something that will make him do or make him gain them uh, but it is in that connection the nature of the connection is that you recognize unending uh, perfection of which these are instances then that recognition belongs to this realm of unending perfection um, and so insofar as human being is one end of that connection of that recognition, human being is, uh, finds themselves uh, worthy of paradise, you know, and, and it seems odd to say that, you know, that I will be in this world and I will find myself worthy of paradise. If you, if you focus on that sentence, the locus of that sentence is the human, then it seems very you know, presumptuous and 
uh, hot, like, you know, very presumptuous to say it would be a paradise. At the same time, if you, but if you focus on, it is the connection that is the locus of that value. It is that belief, that connection, which is simply all offered to the human being, that human being accepts rather than, it's not something that you do, it's like, it's you simply accept it and you accept it, it becomes available, it's there already. So you, you look at it that way, you say yes. Uh, and then that you find yourself in the realm of, well, I, I, I'm, I, I am seeing this is, you know, and it, this must be an eternal mercy of which this mercy is a sign. So I find myself in paradise as not insofar as paradise is that eternal, perfect, unending dimension where everything exists uh, in perfect form forever. I find myself um, face to face in some way. Um, it's, I can't resist saying that's Hajj Baitullah for me, but anyway, uh, you know, when you're face to anyway. So, um, okay. So, Jazakwa uh, Fare. The last part, uh, the last thing you said, this is Hajj for me, right? Because the, like I was hardly hearing. Yeah, I almost said it under the breath because people think this is, you know, like, you know, Sufi and this and that, whatever. But any, anyway, if you, if you read the Quran, like, you know, like, you know, what is Hajj? Pilgrimage to, to God's house, right? It's a very, you know, house is a very intimate place, you know, it's where something is found, something lives there. And, and it, it's curious that God describes that, you know, should make a pilgrimage to Allah, you know, or, you know, and, and so anyway, it, it, it needs to be, you know, you know, understood some way or the other. So either somebody has to go to Saudi Arabia or somebody has to find some way of understanding Hajj. Um, my, you know, how will I find God? Where will I find Him? How will I, I find myself in the house of God? Or, you know, or face to face, you know, wedge, another frequent. How, what do, does it mean, the face of God I will see? You know, um, where is this face of God except that it is, I mean, if, if that's not paradise, what is paradise? So, so, um, so anyway, the, I don't want to move the discussion to something else, but uh, this is uh, what I wanted to say was that it is not human, you know, this is not sort of this epic in value, you know, how, how valuable can I be? Can I be more valuable? I want to be more valuable. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, sure, human beings experience this, but I think this is, the Quran presents reality in this way that once something is interpreted, then this connection, if it is established, this connection is worthy of, uh, yani, as, as a logical result, this, is, this connection is, belongs in the realm of you know, eternal, unending uh, life and beauty. Um, whether, and so the human being is simply has to um, approve it, acknowledge it, accept, accept, and then you find it. So it's not something a value that you have to struggle for in the same way that, you know, I'm trying to be more valuable to do this. So I'm trying to believe so that I can be more valuable. So, yeah, so I'm able to make my point. But. Uh, another comments? Uh, regarding this part? Uh, I'll just make a summary. Uh, since we had also the newcomers. So uh, we are studying this verse. Indeed, we have created man on the most excellent of patterns, then sent him down to the lowest of the law, except those who believe and do good deeds. And the author was uh, going through what these verses are meaning according to him. And then uh, he started talking about belief and said that through the light of belief, 
man becomes so valuable and through the darkness of unbelief man descends to the lowest of the law and again in the verse was mentioning that we created men in the best of the patterns and descend him to the lowest of the law except those who believe and then the word belief was there so the author is now providing a description of what belief is and uh, because of belief man becomes valuable these were the two, first two sentences but then in the third sentence he says because belief connects man to the all glorious maker it is a relation belief is a relation this is his definition so with this relation man becomes valuable so uh a few days ago we were discussing who is human who am i so if i ask this question uh, and the answers that we were getting was for example i am a son i am a husband i am a father so I was trying to define myself with these, but these are all relative, defined relative to somebody else. So, father of my daughter, husband of my wife, and these things are just, it's one question how valuable these descriptions are, but another one is it's bound to somebody else. If the somebody else is not there, then this value is not going to be there either. So, uh, it's sort of, again, it's a relation of description that I'm defining myself with husband relative to my wife but then my wife is also as transient as I am so if she is not there then I'm not a husband anymore vice versa so then is there a way to define myself so that it's not going to be that fragile because if I define myself relative to something that is as fragile as I am, there's no security for me. This is what I guess he means by this darkness. Because everybody's as weak as I am, and I'm trying to find value or some sort of stability relative to them. So this is true darkness. I'm in need of help, and all the ones that I am seeking help from are as needy as I am. So what are they good for? So I should if there is some sort of a connection that I can find so that I connect myself to a firm ground, not like a fragile, something that it, it should have, I should get connected to something which has firm basis, not like baseless things. So this is what I'm understanding when he says, uh, belief is a relation, but it's a relation to a, a absolute source. All glorious me. All glorious me which is, uh, which has a existence by himself. My wife exists because of somebody else or something else. She does not exist or by herself, for example. So if I define myself relative to her, that means I'm actually defining myself relative to whatever is defining her. So it's just a long chain. Who knows to where it goes? So this gives me a lot of insecurity because now I need to preserve everything so that I'm going to be as I am. And the author in here is going to, again, uh, explain us what does all glorious maker mean? Why shall I define myself relative to him? Uh, but I guess this is a important part to answer this question of who am I? And this is what we are doing throughout our life. We are trying to find who we are. But generally, we are seeking the answer to this question in the wrong places, relative to wrong sources. With mistaken relations. Yes. Oh, Hatice Beza plus Ayşenur, you were raising your hand. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I had a comment um, regarding just adding on to kind of what uh, Abdul Rahman and Farzabi were. Hit, um, pointing at or uh, highlighting um, the way the author uh, speaks in the first paragraph is that the light of belief is there almost uh, as though by default because since the darkness is the absence of light right so the darkness 
comes as a result of me severing um, a tie that uh, which is already there. So in the example that Abdul Rahman uh, brought up, like the furniture and the room is already there or the light is already on and I choose to close my eyes. Um, and so when, so, um, just trying to recollect my thoughts. Um, so as also as Farzabi was saying, you know, I don't need to uh, like chase after this thing which makes me valuable, rather kind of going back to my, uh, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, like my fitra, my, um, the way, my natural disposition, my, um, the way my nature, if you will, um, calls me to be in that state with that sort of um, perspective or lens, with, then I am already valuable. It, it's not something that is external out there. Um, and maybe this, we can connect it to what Yusuf Abi was saying. Like, it's not something which I have to seek out there in this channel, um, channel uh, relationship, which then I'm trying to attribute my self-value from, but rather which is already there. And in my severance of it, then do I feel this darkness? Then do I feel this valuelessness? Thank you. And the word relation is uh, really interesting because I guess it's, as Yusuf was saying, it goes, it reminds me that uh, the definition, like what I am. Uh, because when we try to define something, like what is Apple, what is a microphone, we usually do it in relation to a relationship with some other things. It's really hard to find uh, the, the essence of Apple or essence of a microphone without thinking uh, everything else surrounding it. The same way, when I try to define myself, what I am, I always do it in relation to uh, other things, like as you were saying, uh, I'm a, a Turkish person, like in relation to my nation, my country. I'm a son of someone, I'm a father of someone, I'm a husband of someone. Uh, I'm an engineer in relationship to uh, in relationship in, with uh, profession. Or I'm the best engineer. Now you, you relate you towards yourself to other engineers and make a ranking. I'm a Muslim in relationship with other people who you at least assume that sharing some uh, verb wheel with you. But it's always in relation with something we try to find. And author says belief, the way we discuss belief is also a relation. It will give you a new definition. When you believe, you mean it means you're defining yourself in a specific way, which is different than other relationships that you are making. It gives you a new reference point. So it should change, not you know, how you feel, how you, I don't know, understand things, but it should change your definition, what you are. It, it will change the definition of your friends, the objects around you. What they are will change. Now they will be defined in relation to all glorious maker. And now under this description, with this definition, they become uh, worthy of paradise. As I guess when Faraz was saying uh, realm of unending perfection, he was saying, I'm assuming he was referring to the word paradise. I'm just assuming, maybe I was mistaken. Or maybe anything related to uh, divine or dominical in the text. But it doesn't matter. Like when you 
define things in this way in relationship to being created when you assume, accept that that they are created I am <coughs> created then your definition is changed and with this new definition you are worthy of perpetual unending perfection so in here the author is making a lot of definitions with the, within the first three sentences. So he is defining what is highest of the high, which means paradise. So he's making a description of paradise and also descending through darkness of belief, descending to the lowest of the low, which makes it suitable for hell. So it is, uh, then I, I should ask such questions to myself. To me, what does it mean to rise to the highest of the high? And what does it mean to, with the darkness of unbelief going most of the law, then I will find some sort of a description or relatable understanding of what hell is, what heaven is. Because otherwise, uh, I mean, of course, we can read this as uh, the author is borrowing some, my previous understanding of paradise and put it into here. It's going to read fine, but. Uh, my understanding is author in here is making a definition because he gave clearly a definition for belief. He said it's clearly a relation. Belief is a relation. Something that, another maybe definition from the text is something that emits light, mm -hmm. illuminates things. Yes, yes. So it's a relation which illuminates you so that you are going to become, or as with the Abdurrahman's example, you will realize your value through the light of this relation. If I don't use this relation and define myself relative to my wife, then I am bound to like, perish. Because either my wife is going to die or I am going to die. But any, there is nothing that keeps me uh, stable. I'm going to disappear anyways. So such a insecure ground that I am at now. And this gives me like a lot of anxiety because uh, I guess it happens a lot when let's say if my I call to my family today or somehow I get some news from them and somebody tells me that well your your name is not being mentioned in your household anymore they forgot you what, what sort of a feeling would you feel in such a case somebody that you love so much and they are not mentioning you at all. They forget about you. You are not part of their thought process at all. How would you feel? As if you are not existing for them. So this feeling is really this hell in there because I was defining my value relative to them. And now for this reason or that reason, I'm not being mentioned there. So this is really uh, something that badly hurts humans. And this is what hell is for me, because now I am at the lowest of the low, meaning that I am non-existent. I do not exist because I define myself relative to these eyes, and they don't look at me anymore, which practically means I don't exist. And just as a very uh, quick story, uh, there used to be a brother, and he was attending one of those grand memorization classes. There are many grand memorization classes in Turkey. And generally, people go there in like secondary school ages with the family pressure, so they're not very excited about it in general. <laughs> but he was saying that uh, there is a different psychology in there among students because they are there, some sort of pressure is there. If teachers don't pressure them, they don't memorize, they just hang around and don't say anything. So there's some sort of pressure. So students within themselves develop some unwritten rules and he says if a student betrays the rest of the students or one of the students their biggest punishment to this student was nobody was talking to them to this student he says like it's not like beating the guy beating was a like decent <laughs> the, the worst uh, punishment was just ignore him nobody speaks to him no People treat him as if he's not there. He says, 
And this is your only environment because there's no other social circle. You are inside the school 24 seven. Right? There's no outside friends. And so the guy feels like he doesn't exist. And he says, this was making us go nuts. If, if they treat you as such, you go nuts. This is how we are, right? We define ourselves relative to like some friends or some titles or something like this. And then we realize that it's worthless or we are not, they're as fragile as I am, then I am truly feeling hell. Or the author is defining hell as such, this state of feeling non-existing. Human loves existence so much and then, in contrast to that, you feel this non-existence, such a thing that uh, bothers us. And I guess it's very inherent that we love existence. Even I am seeing this in this tiny girl. When I put a cloth to her, putting it through her head, sometimes it blocks her nose for a few seconds, right? She starts just moving her hands. She wants to breathe. She loves life. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to go into non-existence. Very inherent, right? But once we feel like we are not being uh, taken seriously anymore, nobody cares about us, or let's say I'm making this comment right now, if I don't see your heads nodding or everybody looking at their phone, I'm going to get very much offended. Why? So I guess these are all uh, of such defining value relative to something. But I need to find some value which is not going to be as fragile as your nodding. Today you are nodding. Maybe you like it for whatever reason. Tomorrow... I won't nod tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? You will extract it from... I'll shake my head. <laughs> Any other comments? So this relationship or relation uh, and taking it from a, a definition perspective that this is you know our definitions or this becomes our definition. Uh, so when we first read such stuff or when we talk about such stuff, it sounds something extra, something external. Like if you can if you make a relationship with your Lord, with the God, it would be very beneficial for you. Like it will increase your word, or you will be worthy of paradise. But if you don't make this connection with yourself and your creator, uh, okay, you can uh, you know, continue living your life as you wish. It's just an extra. It's something good. As if. Because when we talk about the relationship, it sounds like you know, I am there, myself, and he is there, my Lord, the Creator. We are, you know, existing already independently, and I can make a relationship between two of us. It will <laughs> give me some worth, value. <coughs> uh, but I guess we tend to forget when you know they think it in a that way, this way. We tend to forget that. Our existence, as you were saying, is fragile itself. Like, without making these connections, we cannot describe ourselves. So if I cut this relation uh, with my creator, my Lord, I will try to make all these hundreds or thousands of other connections with everyone else around me. Otherwise, I will become nothing. In order to, just to have a definition for myself, like what I am, who I am, I have to make all these connections. I cannot just say, you know, okay, I'm okay, okay with this connection, without connection, I have to make. I have to say that I am his husband. I made a connection with, him, with her. I have to say that I am a researcher, making a connection with my institute. I'm a friend of him, friend of her, father of his, whatever. I have to make these connections. Otherwise, I'm nothing. And I guess author is telling me that all these connections that you're trying to make, all these relations that you're trying to establish, 
they will take you to hell. If you try to define yourself as husband of Aisha, then you are bound to hell. But if you define yourself in relationship to all glorious makers, then you are worthy of paradise. Any objections? Any? I just when you say you are worthy of paradise, I just want to elaborate. You will find paradise. In fact, well, maybe not. Like you will get hints of paradise, and then you will start understanding paradise more and more within the present time. Like that's how you will be worthy of paradise. And again, yeah. this this is the wording that the author uses in the original text. He says he becomes as if like one of the inhabitants of paradise. Mm -hmm. He gets to the quality to fit becoming an inhabitant of the paradise. And like because we're talking about the definitions, the descriptions of ourselves, so yeah, by definition you become worthy of paradise. Like that means as if you are living in the paradise. This is what you are. You are a what was the word you said? In heaven. In heaven. You are who is, uh, uh, let's say, Abdurrahman. Who is Abdurrahman? Abdurrahman is an inhabitant of the paradise. This is how he defines himself, or how I define him. So it's not something that I'm waiting for. This is what I am. And in the following sentence, he I just defines what he means by light of belief reveals this, as it says, thus man acquires value by virtue of the divine art and inscriptions of the dominical names which become apparent in him through belief. So these inscriptions are there, but to me they become uh, <coughs> apparent if I establish this relation, otherwise I don't see this art in there. So if I establish this relation, I will see all these uh, dominical, the inscriptions of dominical names, and I will become a divine art right? when I make this relation. Any ideas like what does it mean? Uh, acquiring value by virtue of the divine art. The way I understand that, I'm just you know putting it in another English sentence, I'm not explaining. Uh, I think he's telling us that you become a divine art. Just in virtue of being a divine art, you acquire value, meaning uh, through this relation, you realize that you are a divine art. Well, what does it mean, a human being a divine art? Well, I kind of think um, acquiring meaning through the divine art, like nothing, you know, you, you, the faith only gives us light because you know, of all the original wills that it gives us light, right? Even like, so Jude at its very core is just putting your face on the ground, right? It's virtuous because, you know, the all glorious maker says that it's virtuous. And so any meaning, uh, I think, I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't understand what you're saying when you say that the human becomes a divine art. Is it the, the value through the divine art or what, what do you? What do you understand with the divine art? Maybe I'm getting it uh, in the wrong way. That's no, possible. No, no, no, it's possible. Well, what do you understand? No, I, again, I just, I did, from what I took from it was that the, the value that you get is not because you're doing anything, but it's mm -hmm. because the all glorious maker is saying that, you know, you, you will now have value. You will now have this light because of what you're doing. Um, and that any action like inherently is not, not worth it. Not worth anything. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Does that? that, that yeah, that's yeah, what I understood from it. This part I understand. Yeah. Uh, so you take the divine. When I say the human becomes a divine art, I mean you realize that you are being created constantly, mm -hmm. and you are an, yourself is an object of art. Yeah. Like as if artist is you know creating her or his artwork. You are being created in an artful manner. So you are a, a divine art yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's what I meant. I don't know if you have any disagreement or maybe. No, I, I, I, I like that. So, like you're saying, that just 
by having Tukwa and by having like b belief that you're understanding that everything that you do is only, that you can only do it because and, and you're saying that that that acknowledgement that everything that you are and everything that you is is because of creation of the mm -hmm. absolute demand. Okay. So one example, for instance, my so I'm making a relation to you know who's my value. My wife is she's an artist, and the way she uh, you know make art is at least some of them is about just using tiny lines. Like she makes all these draws, all these tiny lines, very tiny, and as they combine, as they come together, you see the uh, piece, uh, like a bird, for instance. But every detail of the verb bird was uh, drawn mm -hmm. by her, right? And let's assume, of course, this is a, a metaphor, like I'm not attributing anything to her, but yeah. So when you see, for instance, there's a white piece of the bird, you know that this white piece is there because she chose it to be there. She did, she did it in on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. She could have, uh, let's say, a, ra a red paint and put a red color there, but no, she said, I want white there, uh, took a white paint and put a white uh, line there. Mm -hmm. So same way, when I look at my, let's say, partial boldness, like my hair is going, I say, I am being created line by line. So if there's a boldness there, it's not an accident, it's not a, uh, let's say, uh, glitch is the system, in the system. Glitch. Glitch. Say it again? Glitch. Glitch. Okay? Yeah. okay. Glitch in the, in the system. He chose it that way. Instead of putting hair there, he on purpose, through his, you know, uh, divine art, put skin there, not hair. So with this lens, when I look at my boldness, I say, it's an artful creation. Everything is under control. So this is what I meant with, uh, like, becoming divine art. Yeah, and that, that, that kind of goes back to what you were saying before about the light versus dark, that it's the same situation, but you have the uh, illumination. I think exactly, what you yes, to yes. Understand it. Yes. And you. that's a great example that you gave, because we know, like at least in this uh, the physical world that we experience, that the color comes through light. If there is no light, there is no color. If there is no light, there is no art, or no painting. So through the light of belief, you start seeing the colors. <coughs> and would you say that this is like a binary in terms of belief and disbelief, the way that the author is describing it? Or do you think that he's, he's hinting at something in terms of, as you kind of increase in belief, you become more and more content with, you know, the requirements placed on you and with the, you know, the world that you're living in and with your situation? Or do you think he's presenting it more as like a one and two, or a zero one situation? The, the way I know about the author and his style, he never, you know, uh, assume any binary mm -hmm. distinctions. Uh, but sometimes, and maybe most of the times, he shows two extremes mm -hmm. to make it more clear, but he always traveled between. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I mean, as, again, as far as I know, the author, the belief is a, a goal, not something that you attain. Okay, you don't say, okay, now I believe. It's a goal, it's uh, something that you try to reach. It's always increase or decrease. Also, I guess in me, let's say, uh, I can, for the sake of example, I can see my hand as art of creator. Let's say I'm appreciating it and saying that this hand cannot happen by itself, cannot be just by chance or randomness, whatever. But then when it comes to uh, my thought, I might attribute it to myself. So I am a believer when it comes to my physical body 
and I say that this this cannot happen by itself. I didn't create it, or my DNA is did it, whatever. But when it comes to my thought, I might be saying that, wow, how great of an idea I came up with. So in this sense, I am a sort of denying where it came from. Therefore, I am in darkness, because next moment, I'm going to make a very dumb mistake. I mean, this smart me of previous moment, which I was boasting with, next moment, such a stupid thing comes out of my mouth. And then I realize how fragile I was building my definition on. So I guess in one sense I'm a believer, in another sense I am not really a believer, so it's not like I'm a complete believer. Because if I, as much as I am a believer, I am in a paradise. Mm -hmm. And as much as I am de in denial or I am like forgetful, I am being in hell, which we experience in life. It's interesting in the Quran, like when, uh, even with the paradise, when it is you know, explained to us, uh, levels of the paradise are mentioned, right? Uh, even with the paradise, it sounds like, you know, the end point and goal, the levels of paradise are mentioned. As if, you know, telling us that there is no end in the perfection that you can attain. It's very... Uh, how to say, like, exciting, very encouraging mm -hmm. idea that there's no end. You can reach as much as you, like, uh, let's say, evoke. Yeah. So again, interesting, as we were discussing on Wednesday about Satan and Adam, and uh, shall we go continue this discussion, but in there, Satan says, in terms of defining his value, says that you created me from fire and him from clay. So he defines a value based on something as fire. He doesn't define a, like something as perishable as fire. And also defines a value for Adam with something as clay. So this is where he's losing the point. Or likewise, I am, I mean, this is again my story. I define a value for myself in terms of, I don't know, my very sound thought process, whatever. Something as perishable as, I don't have these thoughts when like 35 years ago, and 35 years later, there's not going to be any thoughts. Me with my thoughts are going to be under the earth. So what am I boosting with? So we have 11 minutes, which gives, I guess, more than enough time for those who haven't Spoken, yeah. So, Asim, Fariha, Muhammad, don't make us you know, miss your voice. Okay, we can continue. So, the part that I'm having difficulties today, uh, nowadays. The last part of the first paragraph says, his value then is only in respect to the matter of his physical being. Unbelief severs the relation, and due to that severance, the dominical art is concealed. And he says what is left, when this dominical art concealed, what is left is his physical being. Uh, since this matter has only a transitory, passing, temporary animal life, its value is virtually nothing, and then he gives the example. So he says when there is unbelief, your existence is reduced to your physical <coughs> being. Uh, whether you are beautiful or not, whether you are strong or not, tall, short, uh, so what kind of definition of the unbelief is it? Because the way we live life, even in the moments of the unbelief, uh, we try to define ourselves more than our physical being. I don't know, sometimes we, you know, boost with our ideas, which is, you know, going beyond our physical beings. Being. So, I don't know why I say, for instance, Dr. Roman says I'm the best uh, software engineer. Uh, 
So even this such an, you know, the idea best software engineer is a, something beyond his physical being, right? So why he's saying that you are reduced to your physical being without belief? And another thing, like especially nowadays, there are a lot of uh, movements, things like spirituality, which doesn't uh, stem or doesn't uh, best land make, doesn't Indeed. have support. Has support. Does not rely. Does not rely on you know the belief as we would define. But they talk about spirituality. They say, you know, the humans are more than your physical being. You should find your inner good or inner something. They call it different names. Uh, you should find the being inside you. You should find the uh, perfection inside, inside you. All these different ideologies. When you look at them, they completely or let's say at least partially at the first sight. Partially disagree with the belief that I would you know, define. But they also talk about you know, immaterial things. Uh, they you know, sound as if they are not reducing human being to this animal body. Some of them even you know, explicitly say that a oh, human are you know more than animals and so on. So, what different this author says? Maybe nothing different. I don't know. I'm just trying to find out. So, in terms of art, as he was mentioning, so because in the metaphor that he gives and everything, he talks about this artist. And due to the artist, the art becomes valuable. But what is an artist? I mean, if, if I put a computer in here which randomly generates numbers, would I call the output as an art? Or what they mean by art is somebody consciously conveying some sort of a message in a certain way. A mathematician, math is an art. Mathematician displays his message through numbers, but you can follow the message. I mean, if you don't know math, if you don't even know the numbers, for you it is just a bunch of ink, nothing more. But if you know that there is a certain message in there, and where it is coming from with its uh, initial assumptions and axioms and everything, then you read the message and you appreciate what is in there. So, in this existence, what are the initial assumptions or what are the initial axioms on which I am going to base my understanding so that it's going to be satisfactory? Because otherwise, it's the meaninglessness is killing me. So, if, again, when somebody says, well, man is more than matter, material, okay, let's call it immaterial something, but where does it end. So elongating the chain does not help. Where is it going to end in terms of providing me some meaning? Making it more mystical doesn't help. It has to be a uh, thing which will satisfy me. It's going to, like, uh, if for example, now we are in uh, fourth floor. If I say, on what am I standing? And if you show me, okay, on this floor. What is under this floor? Third floor is under you. Okay, what's under the third floor? Second floor. I mean, this cannot go forever. Tell me something on which I will say that, okay, I don't need to go any further than that because, let's say, first floor, I mean, that's not the case, but just for the sake of argument, first floor stands there by itself. Second floor cannot. So tell me something that is carrying us all or giving us meaning all. <laughs> This is what we are interested in. So a conscious source, but this conscious source doesn't need any, uh, any uh, anything else to survive or to exist. 
but this is why he was talking about divine, like the absolute source. So I do exist, or say Zainab exists, it's, but cuteness is there, but I know that the cuteness does not belong to her. But where does this cuteness come from? Is it this random ordering of her cells which makes her cute? If it is so, then the cuteness becomes meaningless. It's just a random ordering of some carbon atoms or whatever. So as long as they disappear, the cuteness disappears, everything disappears, meaning disappears altogether. So there must be something beyond which I'm not going to need any further search. I will say that this satisfies me. And this is, of course, very much related to human's uh, heart. I, I cannot be satisfied with anything else, and the only thing I'm looking for is the satisfaction. I guess the key word that I got from the explanation is mystery, mystifying things. Because I'm not looking for a, a mystical existence, I'm looking for a meaningful existence that I can relate to, that I can live in peace and satisfaction with a purpose. This is really important, I guess, because, uh, again, nowadays, like, uh, just go to the campus of Penn, our university, it's really hard to not take a step without, you know, hearing or seeing some ads about mindfulness, yoga, meditation, it's everywhere. Uh, all the emails coming from the president, CEO of my uh, the, the shop, the uh, hospital, the mindfulness, yoga, again, these the other things, the meditation, somewhere there, like in the message, they want you know us follow such stuff. And I guess the way it is given us is that okay, we try to exploit your uh, animal body all these centuries, we try to maximize, you know, the benefit out of it. Now, because, you know, new generations are a little bit more open-eyed, like, uh, open-minded, they realize that, you know, they are more than maybe human bodies, so we have to feed them with something else. And these mystical things, that nobody knows what they mean. A being inside you. Nobody knows what does it mean, what it means. What feed? If you need, okay, if you need some mystical, here's, here are your mystical. Just sit there, make some sounds, make, put your body in different shapes, and you will have some enlightenment, whatever it means. Do it half an hour, one hour, and then continue working. You have, you know, exams, or you have some other things that you know, just use them as uh, boost your energy, and then continue working because this is what we are trying to do: maximize your work power. And what is missing there is neither they nor I know what I'm doing when I do this. Becoming empty. What does it mean? for a human being to be empty. Nobody knows what it means. It just sounds mystical. So it, I'm not, by the way, like, uh, what is it? Uh, sorry, the Elishtimek. Criticize, yeah. I'm not criticizing or uh, putting them down, like making yoga or meditation. If it helps, it helps. It's like, you know, taking a pill. Sometimes it helps. But taking them as a substitute to belief. Because with belief, it's all about making sense of things. It's all about illuminating your way. As he says, light of belief. Belief illuminates things, makes them clear, clearer. But with mystification, everything becomes darker. Foggy. You don't know Foggy. what is there. Exactly. Perfect. Yes. Foggy. You talk about some mystical beings, but you don't know what is beyond. And it's foggy keep makes you keep in the hope 
so that you are not in total darkness, but you don't know what is there. So just some sort of form there. Yeah. And this is what they try to substitute with light. Substitute the light with fog instead of light. Okay, if you are looking for enlightenment, we can give you fogginess and something. It's not about material. And as again, like it's just as a means of just exploiting you more. The uh, other day I was listening to a guy, a guru of some certain ideology, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, he was receiving the United Nations uh, seminar or something, he's giving a talk to the big people. Well, he talks about you know, all these mystical stuff, uh, how human is beyond everything, and everybody is uh, applauding. Uh, they agree with him, the moderator, the lady, you know, ask questions. And then the moderator asked her, uh, him about vaccines. <coughs> she was a scientist, uh, moderator. Uh, she asked him about the vaccines and she you know, wanted him to uh, support the, uh, the vaccinations and so on. Because some of the religious thoughts are against uh, vaccines. And this guru was against religions. He was trying to substitute the religion with something else. So they were, you know, a part of a team. Let's put it that way. And she asked him about the vaccines, and he, of course, said good things about the vaccines. Uh, just as a note, like a, for the report, I'm not against vaccination. <laughs> I work for a children's hospital, and I'm not against <laughs> vaccination just for the record. But anyway. Uh, she asked him about vaccines and he said good things, but then he said, yeah, of course, there, there are things, uh, good things, but in the US, maybe, you know, you are just exaggerating some. Like there are some vaccines where, which are really uh, essential and necessary, but there are some others, you just, like asking them or demanding them, things like flu or whatever. Maybe they are not that necessary. Maybe you should find a middle ground, he was saying. And she was kind of angry because, you know, he's now uh, you betrayed. <laughs> betraying her. And now he's useless. Right? All this mystical stuff becomes useless now because it doesn't serve. Uh, she said, oh no, there is nothing as, uh, you know, the. Middle ground. Middle ground or the, the more is always better. Something like that. So their team was dissolved, team was dissolved at that moment. So this is the way you know we are fed with these mystifications. As long as it serves for maximizing the uh, economical value, the labor, it's good. But to the extent you start questioning some stuff, the system, and it's uh, too much of mystification. Right? It doesn't work. It doesn't work, yes. Uh, it seems I talked a lot, I'm sorry. We are full time. Uh, if there are any like a quick thoughts or questions, we could have them. Otherwise, let's conclude, inshallah. سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وآخذ دواهم الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتح